do, do you know if he's been doing these kinds of things? Do you, have you heard from him? Has he told you anything about this? Well, when you say when you say doing these kind of things, help me understand specifically what you mean. Well, stealing money, I guess. Oh, well, he has had some issues with being uh, straight up with money. My my uh, my son, unfortunately, has not uh, decided to follow traditional norms when it comes to dealing with money and agreements about money and so forth. He uh, has spent some time, as I think I read properly, in Scambia County or Santa Rosa County, somewhere, uh, that he was convicted of some problems with dealing with people's money. So yes, that's been an issue. As far as what it specifically is, I really don't know because I have not talked to him in over two years, nor will I. That, in case you missed it, was Michael McKay Sr. That was the call I've been waiting to make for three months. Once I found out about McKay Sr.'s history of criminal activity, I knew that, eventually, I would have to at least attempt to interview him. And I knew from the start that that call was going to be tricky. The last time I spoke with Ben, he and I talked about how I might be able to get possible evidence of a connection between Junior and Senior. I told Ben that I planned to call the father, and he said, Senior's probably too smart at this point. I mean, I I wonder how much you can get him to say, honestly. Knowing McKay Sr.'s past successes in the fraud game, I would agree that he's no idiot. This man has managed to rip off at least a handful of his clients well into the six figures and still avoid being implicated in any criminal charges. And I'll get into that history in a few minutes, but that wasn't my only challenge. In fact, his wit and likely some innate time-tested radar he's developed over the years for picking up threats to his illicit achievements were actually the least of my worries. It really depends on how long you can get him to talk, you know. I mean, just the harsh reality of it all and the more you learn, it's the more like, you know, I I like you, so we're having the conversation. Ben and I figured out that I basically had to get McKay Sr. to admit terrible things about his son while also A, not setting off any alarms, B, not making him too cautious or reserved with his responses to my questions, and C, probably most importantly, but frankly least likely, maybe even get him to talk about his own history of fraud. After all, I had two objectives. First, I wanted to see if there was any semblance of a connection that existed between junior and senior in the investment scams happening in Florida, And second, I wanted to probe into possible places Junior might be keeping the money. I wasn't holding out much hope for any response at all, and neither was Ben. I suspect, right, there will be probably just straight bold-faced lies of like, oh, I had no idea, you know, I I was in the dark until 2018, you know, to your point, da-da-da-da-da. And in the end, we figured out that it came down to one single question. Ultimately, the question, right, and you can chew on this, I'll leave you with this thought, is, you know, hey, at what point did you, were, were you made aware that your son had, you know, any litigation going on? If Senior tells me that he does know about Junior's role in the crime spree of felony theft and fraud, why has he sat and watched his son as he's destroyed people's lives? If he tells me that he doesn't know about it... Just leave it at that, right? Because, <laughs> you know, I think depending on how he answers that or doesn't, we'll tell you everything you need to know. I asked Ben if he thought Senior was actually unaware of his son's activities. Well, no, I highly doubt that, right? Because Senior's wife had her savings taken. I mean, it, and that was before me, right? Hmm. I mean, that was, I don't know exact dates, but at least back in 2016, I would guess. And that statement was actually backed up by Sam Parker. I swear, I want to say it was his mom, though, several years ago, that called and was basically just explaining to me that he had taken a lot of money. I want to say, you know, basically she was talking about him wiping out their retirement money. And in that, you know, said, hey, it's for investments, but they never got returns. 
and was trying to ask me had I heard from him or knew his whereabouts or whatever. But if I remember right, because this is that's why the name sticks out because it's, it's not. I mean, there's no never been anybody else that you get phone calls from multiple people about, you know. So if Ben Cotter and Sam Parker and Sierra Dozier and even I know about that level of criminality, how could his father not know? At that point, you're not going to do any investigative sort of work to figure out or just ask your son. I mean, God, you're freaking flesh and blood. You're not going to say, hey, what's going on? Has anyone filed suit? Da, da, da. Like, you know what I mean? Like, it's just it's normal conversation at some level. I find it very hard to believe that, you know, completely in the dark. So how do I get there? How do I go from being a journalist doing a story on the decades of criminality of a man's son that also bears a striking resemblance to that man's own history. I had to offer the least threatening space in which McKay Sr. would be motivated to open up about his son. I also had to keep from burning any bridges to future conversations. After all, Ben's case was still ongoing. McKay Jr.'s felony trial has still yet to happen, and if it turns out that the prosecution took my lead and started looking into the matter further, he may yet become part of his son's story. So I would also want to develop a measure of trust that I could lean back on later that might leave him open to future talks. And of course, a tertiary benefit of not setting up any red flags the first time I talked to the man would be that so long as I could pull off a convincing persona, I wouldn't rouse suspicion in the way I would if I presented myself as a journalist. Knowing that Senior has likely had several devastating calls over the years from people his son has ripped off, I chose to create a scenario McKay was familiar with. I chose to impersonate a concerned father calling on behalf of his daughter who just happened to date McKay Jr. the year prior. And it worked. In fact, it may have even worked too well. Hello? Hi, Mr. McKay? Yes. Hi, my name's John Merriam. I wish I was calling on better terms. I'm, I'm calling about your son. You have a son named Mike McKay lives in Gulf Breeze, correct? That's correct. That was how the conversation started. But within 30 seconds of answering the phone, he said this. Wow. Um, well, number one, not a great time to go into that right now. I'm, I'm at work. i uh, be happy to call you back when I leave here in probably a half an hour or so. And honestly, as soon as I heard him say he would have to call me back, I assumed that he was just seasoned enough to know that he needed to get off the phone as soon as possible when calls like this came through. I was also surprised that he told me he was working. As I'll detail shortly, he lost his license to work in the financial field, which kind of made me think he was happily retired on the money he's taken from the last decade of his financial crimes victims. But, much to my surprise, he did call me back. This is John. John, this is Mike McKay. Hey, thank you for calling back. I appreciate it. No, no problem. I don't know how much help I'm going to be, but I'll help you any way I can. I set up the story like this. My daughter was dating your son for part of the year last year. She's in, in college down there, Florida State, Panama City. She had about $45,000 in the bank. I know because I put it there. She had a hard time telling me this, but it turns out that she told me your son found out how to access that money and, and took it. Um, and I'm, I'm calling to see if you could help me with a little bit of the backstory. I don't know where he is. I don't really care. Um, I'm not trying to be callous or whatever. I'm just telling you the state of affairs for me. And if I were a dad and I had a young daughter, first of all, he's in his 40s. How old is she? She's 32. Yeah, but that's a good 10 year difference between her and him. More than that, probably 13 years. She was born in 78, so this November he'll be 45. So... If I were a dad, I would do what I can. Of course, she's an adult, you know, she's going to make her own decision one way or the other, but there's nothing that he possesses that is something that a right-thinking woman would want that she could not find in another individual who maybe would treat her in a better manner. Now, before I get too far into that, I should go ahead and detail McKay Sr.'s history of financial fraud. 
Okay, so by this time in the investigation, I've established that there was one central link between Sierra Dozier and Derek Anglin and Angie Bod and Robert Stoll and KC, who was mentioned in the first season. And then there was also Dustin Reeves and Stephen Roche and James Mangus. The link is that they all worked, at least in part, with Michael McKay Jr. Now, the Ohio connection for every one of these characters, except for those who were obviously already living in Florida, was now solidified by Michael McKay Sr., the man living in Ohio with a direct, familial relation to Michael McKay Jr. Deb Chrysalis was the first of Jr.'s victims I confirmed unequivocally who was sent by Sr. to invest in Jr.'s Florida real estate scam. He, see, my husband had dealt with his father, and Jim then felt if father's honest, then the son would be honest, you know? And um, But the son wasn't, <laughs> yeah. you know? And um, so we gave him money to invest, and it just he didn't do what he said he would do. And the second, of course, was Ben Cotter. And when I asked Ben if McKay Sr. was the one who introduced him to his son, he said this. Did he introduce you guys? Sure did. Really? Deb Chrysalis says she met him the same way. Like, she, her husband was investing with Sr., and that turned into... Okay, my son has this uh, d- deal where you can put money in with him. It's separate from me, et cetera, et cetera. But he made that introduction. Yep, that's the play. Knowing that a key ingredient to Junior's con was an introduction or a recommendation, I started finally connecting the dots to Junior's victims in Florida. There was Nicole. He came recommended to us from our granite person that we had found that we were ordering our countertops from. Then there was Felix. The only reason I did business with him because he came referred to me by a general contractor. Then there was Bo. The dealings were with two people. Then there was Mr. Williford. My wife talked to a bunch of different people, you know, and sold her. Then, of course, the anonymous victims. We had a house built. Uh, our builder might know more about him. In fact, when I piled through all my interviews for this last episode, I found that there were only two victims that told me they actually found McKay by walking into his storefront. And they both said the same thing. So we went in to his establishment. And let me say this up front. He knew exactly what he was doing from the beginning. Ripping people off. He really did. He was in a regular brick and mortar building right on Davis Highway. Mm -hmm. Looked very legit. We went in, the inside gave us no reason to doubt that he wasn't who he said he was. And it actually all makes sense. I mean, why trust someone who walks up to you and tries to sell you cabinets or ask you to blindly invest in a fix and flip scheme? On the other hand, if someone already working in the industry tells you to put your trust in company X, that's usually all the credibility most people need. Of course, Junior could have simply learned this over time. I want to be fair, but in the event that this was one of his father's many lessons on the road to Crookville, I decided it warranted checking into McKay Sr., and looking into his past was almost dizzying. In the last episode, I finally arrived at the point where I had two names, Michael Norman McKay, the 43-year-old inmate currently incarcerated in Florida, and Michael Richard McKay, the 70-year-old investment advisor from Cincinnati, Ohio. The only question now was whether or not the relationship between the two goes deeper than father and son. I didn't know it when I first started searching, but my quest into the financial world was actually how I'd stumbled across McKay Sr.'s pattern of fraudulent activity. Okay, so the go-to organization for regulating brokerage firms and exchange markets is the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority, or FINRA for short, which is how I'm going to pronounce it from here on out. When I searched the FINRA database for McKay's broker license, I came up with 36 results. These included lots of McKay's and variations of the McKay name, like Michael Todd McKay and Christopher Michael McKay and Michael Thomas McKay Buono and so on and so forth. Alas, there was no exact match for Michael Norman McKay. Cross-checking McKay's LLCs provided me with no license information there either, and when I looked up all of his websites to see if he'd listed his broker's license there, I also found Bubkus. In short, through handfuls of websites, opened and closed businesses, and a dozen or more years of representing himself as an investment professional, Michael McKay Jr. is no more certified to manage financial assets than my eight-year-old nephew. 
Though I wasn't entirely shocked to find this information out, I was a bit intrigued by another thing that I found on the FINRA database. The name I'm now familiar with, Michael Richard McKay, came up listed as being barred indefinitely from practicing any form of financial activities that require a broker's license. That is what you call a bell ringer, a red flag in a sea of black and white documents. Knowing that FINRA is technically a private corporation separate from the government itself, I cross-referenced this same information on the SEC's website, and what I found there not only blew my mind, it created an almost mirror image of what I knew of McKay Jr. Of course, it was all about a much older man, but that man would be right about his father's age. After I made the connection that they were father and son, and after I set my jaw back in place, it was just a matter of reading before I lined up everything that I would ever need to know about McKay Sr. Hold that thought. Small Town Justice will be right back. It was just a matter of reading before I lined up everything that I would ever need to know about McKay Sr. Okay, so keep that on the back burner for a minute. Investment fraud is big business. In just the last year alone, the FBI's Financial Crimes Unit indicated it received more than $100 billion worth of complaints called in. And that doesn't include other centers for fraud investigation or other fraud crimes in general. The basic premise is that a broker offers anything from shares to futures to liquid investments to real estate investments, all on the premise of big returns, or at least a certain number of returns. They either only deliver returns below their agreed amount, or they don't deliver at all. Obviously, to avoid criminal prosecution, there needs to be at least a provable attempt to deliver on what's agreed. This is the route taken by McKay Sr., and it's not only paid off in keeping him out of jail, it's also a very effective tactic in keeping his victims quiet. Hi Kyle, this is Beth from Meyer Wilson. You had called, I think it was last week, in regards to the um, McKay matter. Oh, right. Yeah, so I just wanted to call you back, um, and um, we did look into it. We did find that client that um, was against uh, Michael McKay, and because of our confidentiality agreement, we really can't say much, I think, that'll help you because we're pretty bound by that, but I just wanted to give you a call back and let you know that. Oh, okay. Well, I appreciate you following up. Is there, um, you can at least tell me that this is a civil case. It didn't spill over into criminal. Is that true? Correct. Yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. So is are there any criminal cases attached to it or th- that you know of or anything like that? Not that I know of. No, once it was done on our end, I don't we didn't see it again. So, nope, by, by as far as we know on our end, we, it did not go any further. Than okay. That. And could you tell me if if your case and and things involved in that case were at least limited to Ohio? It was just Ohio. Okay, just just Ohio residents, okay. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, All right. thank you very much. That was a representative for the attorney from one of McKay Sr.'s victims. As you heard, to reach a settlement, the victims agreed to never speak about the case they had against him. It goes like this. The investment goes down, the delays start moving from months to fiscal quarters, and finally, the investor has had enough and filed suit. The McKays pay out a little bit, but not the full principal. And since in most states the courts do not consider interest accrual as part of the total that makes a victim whole, the principal is all that's considered for criminal restitution or civil agreements. In the case where the broker doesn't deliver at all, the matter is usually brought into court. But even if the victim wins a judgment, the court still leaves it up to the successful litigant to locate and navigate the complex channels necessary for recovery of their damages. And during that time, the fraudster basically banks on the notion that the investors will tire of chasing them through hoops and cut their losses. If this doesn't yet sound familiar, this is the linchpin linking all of McKay Jr.'s scams, from the delays to the excuses to the outright threats and intimidation tactics. It's all geared toward forcing people to abandon any hope of ever seeing their money again. This is the pattern that I found when I started researching investment fraud in general, and there are two people that stick to this routine time after time. These two people, of course, are Michael McKay Jr. and Michael McKay Sr. In rare circumstances, a long-term investment fraud also involves a broker going into a community of investors and actually handing back big gains and uh, other awards that are promised at the onset. 
and when other investors start seeing those returns come in, others jump in as well. Then, once the fraudster has a sufficient amount of money they want in total, they cut their losses and take off with the principal investments from the bigger fish. So bringing this back to McKay Sr., in a response to FINRA regarding the last criminal activities before losing his license on June 27, 2019, Michael McKay Sr. wrote a letter that they later published on their website. You can easily find this letter in an internet search, which is entitled, Michael McKay, FINRA Bars Cincinnati Financial Advisor. Now, I'll get to that complaint in just a minute, but in short, this article essentially is a notice of disciplinary action taken by FINRA against McKay Sr. at the terminus of his broker certification. And this is important to note because by the time FINRA took this action against him, he worked as a financial advisor for an impressive host of companies. These include Transamerica and World Equity Group, both in Cincinnati, WMA Securities and World Group Securities, both in Duluth, Georgia, and John Hancock Distributors Incorporated and the John Hancock Mutual Life Insurance Company. Those two are both in Boston. Now, while that list of resume points makes McKay Sr. out to be quite a formidable applicant in the financial industry, it's when you look closer that his CV starts to look strikingly similar to his son's. First, when we look at Junior's companies, none of them really lasted longer than one or two years, at least per the documents that I was able to dig up. Comparing this to McKay Sr., he was with the John Hancock firms for an average of two years each. He spent another two years with World Group Securities and only one year with World Equity Group. Transamerica was his longest post, lasting from 2012 to 2019, a little over seven years. If his short stints in these firms were not indicative of his son's patterns of nosedives, the alarming number of complaints during that time certainly is. His early years in the game largely started out pretty smoothly. Between 1994 and 2002, which marked his time working for WMA Securities and the two John Hancock firms, McKay Sr. had no issues arise on his record. But in 2005, just two years after starting work for World Group Securities Incorporated, he left immediately following allegations that he'd been, quote, involved in a commission sharing with a non-securities registered individual in connection with the sale of a securities product, end quote. In other words, he took an unregistered partner and got caught when the deal went sour. Now this part's key because rather than being fired, which would have potentially barred re-employment at the firm, he quit which apparently paved the way for him to go back to World Group Securities for another stint spanning from 2009 to 2012. And in that time, he was slapped with a federal judgment for nearly $40,000. His employment with World Group ended shortly thereafter, and McKay Sr. never returned to work for them again. But that wasn't his last bout with federal judgments. In April of 2018, another lien appeared on his record for more than $10,000. But that time, McKay Sr. had been working for Transamerica for almost six years. Which begs the question, if he'd left two previous firms amid allegations of dealing off the books, was this his first violation with Transamerica, or was it just the first time he'd gotten caught? Whatever the answer to that question, he only lasted another nine months with Transamerica. And that nine months is pockmarked with the scope of scandal that makes McKay Jr.'s crimes look like candy store pickpocketing. In January of 2019, McKay Sr. was, quote, permitted to resign after receiving, quote, allegations from two customers that the representative had referred them to an outside investment opportunity that was not approved by the firm, end quote. Now, if you've been keeping up with the timeline from the previous episodes, you'll know that this matches up almost precisely with the 2018 investments that Sierra Dozier indicated Jr. received from his father through his Ohio connections. Now keep this in mind because I'm going to circle back to it in a bit. In specific language, the complaint states that on or around January 25th, 2019, very beginning of the year, he relinquished his position as an investment company and variable contracts products representative after Transamerica sent him a notice of termination of his securities industries registration. In other words, they terminated his certification as a financial principal, which then effectively disqualified him from working for Transamerica. It's kind of a flashy way of saying he was fired by way of an inability to continue participating in company business. Not six months later, on July 5th, 2019, after an apparent period of investigations into those same allegations, FINRA finally sanctioned McKay Sr. Just one month later, another complaint was filed with FINRA claiming that a woman had given McKay Sr. a check for $300,000 for a real estate investment gone awry. 
The record states that McKay settled that case for the amount of $235,000. Not to be outdone, in December of that same year, multiple claimants filed a case against McKay Sr., alleging that he'd involved them in an unregulated investment for $620,000. Sr. settled that one for an amount of $425,000. Still on a roll, on the very last day of 2019, a claim was filed against McKay Sr., alleging that he'd taken $427,000 of equity trust funding and settled for an amount of $250,000. And almost one year later, January 27th of 2020, McKay Sr. apparently settled the full amount of a $100,000 claim that he'd sold, quote, unsuitable investments. That last settlement notwithstanding, the claimants in these cases lost $437,000, and that, of course, doesn't include the nearly $50,000 in federal judgments. This was all, by the way, within a period between July 2019 and January 2020. Not a bad haul for half a year's work, keeping all the money and never going to jail. Oh, and here's a bonus. Whenever a settlement is reached in court, the related monies are not required to be claimed on taxes. But there's another layer to this. While all this is happening, McKay Jr. is also being brought to court more frequently than any time in his entire criminal history. I detailed that in the first episode. In case you don't remember, here's that snippet. Also in 2003, he stepped up his game and was convicted of felony theft in Warren County, Ohio, which was his first of several felonies to come. In more recent years, his pattern of criminal activity took on less of a thrill-seeking role, but still landed him in much hotter water. In 2017, a class action lawsuit was filed against his company REPF Fund One, that was followed by a March 2018 felony grand larceny case of exploiting an elderly woman for more than $10,000. In short, between his first felony in 2003 and his class action lawsuit in 2017, Junior's criminal activity was largely dormant. So here's the question. Is it a coincidence that McKay Sr. is funneling Ohio investors to McKay Jr.'s Florida land scams at the exact same period of time that he himself was being fined and dragged into court on similar cases? And this leads us back to my conversation with McKay Sr. Because in the middle of both McKays being dragged into court on the same kinds of scams, McKay Sr. told me this. I apologize. It's not the kind of person I am. It's not the way I raised him to be. So, unfortunately, he has taken his own direction. I'll probably be using that quote again, but let's break down the conversation I had with him. Most of what McKay told me seemed to come from a place of concern. However, he did lie to me at least once that I can prove. He told me that he hasn't seen or spoken to his son in more than two years. I have not talked to him in over two years, nor will I. But in a video that I received from one of McKay Jr.'s victims, McKay Sr. is seen right in front of Jr.'s cabinet storefront on November 16th, 2020. At the time of my conversation with Sr., that's less than two years by four months. That's a third of a year. In other words, he hasn't not seen his son in more than two years. He hasn't seen his son in a year and about eight months. And in that video, by the way, Senior is seen coming from inside his son's storefront, which was closed to business at the time. And since Junior was the sole owner of that business, I'm assuming he would have to be required to open the door for his father. He may have even been in the building at the time of the recording. Then there's the actual conversation between Senior and the person recording the video. That person, by the way, is none other than Nicole's mother. Listen closely. Is your son going to go with you to Ohio? Is your son going to go with you to Ohio? No. Because I'm not feeling real fuzzy when no, I'm seeing you emptying the store like this. I'm not emptying the store. All that stuff's staying. I'm just taking my personal belongings. Hold that thought. Small Town Justice will be right back. Is your son going to go with you to Ohio? What's that? Is your son going to go with you to Ohio? No. Because I'm not feeling real fuzzy when I'm no, seeing not. you emptying the store like this. I'm not emptying the store. All that stuff's staying. I'm just taking my personal belongings. In case there's too much background noise, that was McKay Sr. saying he was just gathering a few personal belongings. 
Yes, he actually claimed that he came all the way down from Cincinnati, Ohio, crossing five states in an 11-hour drive to Gulf Breeze so he could gather a few personal belongings he could fit into a single car and then turn right back around and do that whole drive all over again. This explains why Nicole's mother stated she was a little shaky about believing him. Because I'm not feeling real fuzzy when I'm seeing you empty in the store like this. Simply put, it doesn't make any sense that McKay Sr. would make that entire drive all the way down to his son's storefront without personally interacting with him. And keep in mind, this is after 2015 when McKay Sr. told me that Without filing a legal action and going for discovery and all that stuff, I doubt seriously there's going to be any way to find or recover the money uh, because other people have tried that and it has not borne any fruit. And he was referring to other people that he knew his son had ripped off. That is criminal activity that McKay Sr. was aware of in 2020 when Ben Cotter first postulated that his father would deny knowledge of his son's crimes. Yeah, I just, I find it so hard to believe, you know, that father had no idea, right? I mean, come on. An interesting, if ironic, thing about the scene that was captured on that video, by the way, is that the first three letters of McKay Sr.'s license plate are H-O-X, which could potentially be pronounced as hoax. At any rate, back to that earlier comment for a moment. I have not talked to him in over two years, nor will I. Now, it is possible that Senior just said that on a whim because 2020 was two years ago. However, he said two other things in that conversation that I found curious. The first was this. And I'm going to ask you to do me a favor and... Not, not tell her about this conversation because if she relates it to him, there could be some blowback on me and my wife, and I'd really prefer not to have that situation. Now, technically, he didn't ask me to keep quiet about the conversation publicly, but that's probably because he thinks that the only link made between him and this case is through my non-existent daughter. So what kind of blowback is he referring to? Does he have a history of violence or anything? All right. Unless, of course, he was lying to me about knowing his son's history of violence. Because McKay Jr. had already been arrested once in Ohio for assaulting his then-wife, Kim Riddle, and also allegedly assaulted Sierra Dozier. I think there was a rumor that one of my witnesses said that you'd been uh, assaulted. Do you want to... Yeah, numerous times. (laughs) Yeah. In either case, was he really worried about my daughter? Or was it more about keeping his own fraud from being made public? After all, if a story broke about his and his son's crimes, a link might be made. And if a link is made, it might expose a carefully crafted arrangement where Senior sends investors to Junior, who then kicks back a percentage. I should say that this is all still conjecture, but it leads me to the second curious thing that he told me. I apologize. That's not the kind of person I am. It's not the way I raised him to be. So, unfortunately, he has taken his own direction. Okay, so the first thing I'm curious about is why would he apologize? I apologize. Right, like no one volunteers an apology unless they're technically culpable in something. But second to that, why would he care about my opinion of whether or not Junior's choices don't reflect on him? I never once asked about his character. It's kind of like if you're at an office party and you make a harmless joke that Frank from IT is cheating on his wife. And everybody laughs, but then Frank laughs so long and so loud that he draws everybody's attention. You know, and before the joke, no one considered the idea that Frank was actually cheating on his wife. But after he volunteered this obviously poised response to an unexpected inquiry of sorts, people start to question. That's how I felt when Senior volunteered, without being asked, that he was of patrician character. He also said this. He had learned some of that from me, how to pro- properly and correctly invest in real estate and loan money out on fix and flip deals. He said that Junior learned the business from him and then stutters when he said that he trained him on how to, quote, properly and correctly invest in real estate. Pro- properly and correctly invest in real estate and loan money out on fix and flip deals. Knowing that he's lost his license for his own tarnished past in the financial field and assuming that I don't know of that same history, was his broken speech the result of his conscience getting in the way? That's something that I immediately wondered. 
He didn't stutter at any other time in the conversation, and he also didn't volunteer anything about his past misdeeds that might reassure a concerned father that he may actually have some responsibility in his son's choice to follow in his footsteps. So let's move forward and talk about Ben Cotter, who initiates his six-figure fraud investigation back in 2018. Up until recent episodes, I've kept his name anonymous because he really didn't appear in any of the court filings that I could find, but he's now officially named as a victim in the case I alluded to way back in season one. We do have a local council now in Florida as well, and so I've just pretty much left it up to my councils now uh, to just, you know, do their thing and, you know, file demand letter into a complaint and all that. So, you know, the ball's rolling. I found out about him when I first started contacting McKay Jr.'s victims. I was very sheepish about playing his full interview in the past because his upcoming case was still yet to be brought before the county prosecutor. Now that that's happened, Ben's case is a matter of public record. And fan club members can find that full interview as well as the full interview that I had with McKay Sr. in the members area of the Legally Insane fan club. That can be found at either LegallyInsaneFilms.com or SmallTownJusticePodcast.com. This process has... um uh, matured me in a different sense in terms of humanity and what people do. Um, not all people, but more than you think or know or want to believe. Ben's interview was very revealing, both in the scope of his case as well as the paranoia that McKay Jr. instilled in him since he handed over a small fortune and found out just how deep McKay's rabbit hole really goes. As you can appreciate and imagine in these scenarios, Um, One cannot be too cautious from the standpoint of who we are dealing with and their insanity in terms of capabilities and ability to think tremendously crazy, right? I'll tell you this. Once you get done by these type of people, right, it fundamentally changes your psychology, your ability to reason at just deeper levels than, frankly, humans should have to imagine, uh, let alone do. Ben's been a big help in getting me the information I've needed to conclude my investigation. I do think that I will be instrumental in helping you get to the next level in the the case, uh, documentary, etc. Uh, how does that sound as next steps? Make no mistake, Ben Carter is basically who this entire story is about. Even though there are a slew of victims, their cases are, at least per my research, largely concluded. And because Junior is finally facing first-degree felony theft charges stemming from Ben's 2017 investment of $440,000, and because a conviction of this type could land McKay in jail for 30 years in a state-level prison, the finality of this trial is where this entire investigation will end. So that wraps up where everything's at right now and where it's headed. But one final question remains. Throughout the course of this investigation, I've relied on background checks and statements from victims and ultimately the sum total of what that all amounts to in order to assess the true character and criminal capacity of Michael McKay Jr. I've come very close several times to getting hard evidence of the total damage that he's caused to his victims. I've been able to paint a terrible picture based on the palette he's given me, but I've never been able to actually lock in unequivocally a ceiling, a worst case figure or description. But that's partially because I've never actually had one impartial person who knows the actual totality of Junior's criminal activities. That is, until now. When I first titled this season Mad Michael's Millions, I did so adding up the four, five, and six figure amounts to come to a number that did actually make it into the millions. Barely so, but that was before talking to McKay Sr. I will leave you with this last quote, which, when I heard it, made my heart not only sink from the sheer devastation that this man has caused so many people in his ruinous path, It also gave me a sense of thankfulness that my friend Micah, who first put me in touch with this story, met Robert Stoll instead of McKay. She still got ripped off, that's true, and that's a shame. 
but she is doing quite well now, and I'd hate to think of what might have happened if they'd run into this bigger threat to the Pensacola community instead of him. And it also gives me a deep sense of anticipation in the hopes that the Florida state prosecutors will give this case their full attention. After I heard this next quote, it became indubitably clear to me that they're dealing with a man who is clearly not going to learn how to get along in civil society. He is truly a criminal for whom long-term sentences were made. Here's that snippet. My first concern is for safety, of course, but my second concern is for the money that we lost. I mean, do you think there's any hope of possibly ever getting that back? Yeah. If I could give you any idea where I thought it might be, I would happily do so. Because if that were the case, there's 100000 plus interest that should be coming back to me and my wife. And there is $2 million that I know belongs to some other people that should go back to them. It has not. For the next season of Small Town Justice, I take a trip down to a tiny town in the desert southwest where the second mayor was convicted of hiring a hitman to kill the first mayor. The premise may sound simple, but the story is anything but. The two mayors at one point were actually best friends. They were also the two wealthiest, most powerful men in town, and that one event split the town so deeply that the chasm it left behind can still be felt 30 years later. There's a war for water rights, an unveiling of nuclear-level corruption, and even a conspiracy that inspires a chilling series of events to unfold that threatens town politics even to this very day. Stay tuned for The Murder Mayors, Season 3 of Small Town Justice, which I'll be going into the studio to edit this month. To get the updates straight from my email to yours, head over to LegallyInsaneFilms.com and when the pop-up appears, enter a valid email and confirm your subscription once it arrives in your inbox. While this officially concludes the Mad Michael's Millions investigation, it does not conclude the season. I've had a recent uptick in memberships, so I wanted to do something extra special to show my appreciation. Remember back in the last episode when I said I'd follow up with the attorneys prosecuting McKay's case on behalf of Ben Cotter? Well, I did, and it was a very telling interview. I have to let you know that it's scheduled for a docket day, which is sort of a status day, I believe next week. Uh, there's been a motion to continue, and previously I've talked with the defense attorney on that matter. I don't, I don't know what's going to happen yet, uh, but it's sort of for a status day next week. The interview itself isn't the only important thing that happened. It actually appears that my talk with the state prosecutor's office has influenced a change in their strategy for prosecuting the case. Oh, and remember when Nicole told me that Michael McKay had been referred to her by Legacy Granite Countertops in Pensacola? Well, I followed up with them too, and they actually remembered recommending him. You guys ever worked with uh, Mike McKay? He does cabinets and flooring. Oh, yeah. Yeah? Yeah. What can you tell me about him? He's really good. I mean, he does really superior work. He does great work. Um, I haven't worked with him some time now. That was definitely an interesting talk. So, as a bonus episode that I'm releasing exclusively for my Tier 2 members, I'll not only be releasing that interview, but also some hardline commentary on what it could mean for the finality of Ben's case. And trust me, if you hear what I hear and what they told me, and more specifically what happened after the interview, you might be as convinced as I am that they're taking this case much more seriously. You'll definitely want to check out that bonus episode, but there's a lot more to hear. Throughout the course of creating the first and second seasons for Small Town Justice, which were entitled The Cabinet Con with Robert Stoll and Mad Michael's Millions with Michael McKay, I've worked nearly nine months and interviewed dozens of people. I've created crowdfunding campaigns to help make the victims whole. I've offered copies of my latest true crime documentary as incentive for people to chime in and donate. And more importantly, I've also created an online community for these and other victims of similar crimes. 
Almost everything that I put out there is free and available publicly. There are only two exceptions to that, and I'll talk about those in a second. But first, I wanted to let you know that one of the most important things that I do as a media producer is to create a community for you, my listener. If all you want to do is listen to the show, that's perfectly fine, and I hope you enjoy it. But for those of you who have been affected by local thugs or corrupt officials disrupting life in your community, I also wanted to create a space where you can go to discuss your stories of local crimes happening right now and to reach out to other survivors and targets of criminals like Michael McKay and Robert Stoll and to share resources that have helped you find success. Because in the end, no matter how divided we become as a nation, it really is all about helping each other. If you'd like to join the community that I've created, go to Facebook and search for Legally Insane Sleuths. You can also find that link at smalltownjusticepodcast.com. Okay, so remember a second ago when I said that almost everything I do is free? The first of two exceptions is the stuff that keeps the show going, like the extended interviews that I have with the witnesses and the perps and the victims, the live streams that I do, the case files, the mugshots, the background checks, and even the other podcast that I release, which is called Legally Insane News. And of course, for the film fans out there, I also have an all access membership that includes all of that stuff I just mentioned and my latest true crime documentary. And with that membership, a new outtake or extra will come out every two weeks for the next 12 months. So there's plenty of content out there. The second exception to my free list will be the concluding episodes of the investigations. Now, this episode is obviously free and open to the public, but after this investigation, all of the concluding episodes, meaning the final episode of each investigation, will be reserved for my supporters as a special thank you. To join, just head over to smalltownjusticepodcast.com and click join the fan club from the menu at the top. There's also a link in the slider. If you'd like to send feedback about the show or to pitch us a story or even to hire me to do narration work for your audio project, which I can do remotely, of course, send an email to thejusticepod at gmail.com. Small Town Justice is a production of LegallyInsaneFilms.com. I'm your host, Kyle O'Donnell. Thanks so much for listening. We'll see you next time.